You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is the Chicksaw Nation. Now, the Chicksaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anna Toby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. Our third sponsor is Diffie Ford Lincoln down in El Reno. Now, this one makes me so happy because these guys are great friends of mine. Um, play a lot of golf together. I've bought my cars from them. Do most of my oil changes down there, have a cup of coffee, hang out down in El Reno. It's a good spot to go. And not only are they great friends, but they provide a great service. So for over 60 years, a third generation family owned Oklahoma business down in El Reno. They're also in Bethany as well. So people in the Bethany area know the Diffies really well. But if you're looking for anything new used, um, Ford, Lincoln, or whatever, I'm sure they could find anything you want. Um, check them out, DiffieFord.net, and then on Instagram at DiffieFordLincoln. This episode is presented by the Choctaw Nation. The Choctaw people have a rich history and a bright future. At the Choctaw Cultural Center, you can take part in a story 14,000 years in the making. Stroll through our immersive exhibits portraying Choctaw life from the moment our ancestors emerged from the Nani Way High in Mississippian homelands to the Trail of Tears, where we lost so many loved ones, and finally to the modern-day tribe making a positive impact on local communities throughout southeastern Oklahoma. Try your hand at our social dancing and stickball and learn more about our vibrant culture through demonstrations, workshops, and classes. The kids will have a blast in our Luxie Activity Center. The Choctaw Cultural Center is more than a museum. It's a living, breathing experience. Visit ChoctawCulturalCenter.com to plan your visit. And let's get into today's episode. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hearn here, host, back with another episode. Gives me great pleasure to welcome Chief Wade Gawley to the podcast, uh, Chief uh, of Police for Oklahoma City. Yes, yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a pretty big city, right? When people think of, you know, they don't think of downtown is very big, but the borderline of Oklahoma City is far and wide. Yeah, about uh, a little over 621 square miles, one of yeah. the largest uh, land area cities in the country. Yeah. So pl- being a police officer, I'm, I'm from the UK originally, right? So police officers in the UK are very different to police officers here. They're just totally different setup, you know, whereas, you know, e- even just the things you could, the things you do, the things you can do. Uh, my brother, younger brother's a police officer back home. So it's fun to chat with him about certain things. And I was talking to him about what, you know, who I was interviewing today and, he had a bunch of questions, which I'm sure we can get to later. <laughs> but it is interesting to see, to see both sides of it. Um, yeah, very interesting. So, obviously, chief of police since 19, was it? July of 2019. Okay. So you've, I mean, in the last four or five years, you've seen a lot of things and dealt with COVID and all the other stuff. and Yeah. A lot of things that, you know, as police chiefs all around the country, we've never dealt with before. Um, it's interesting too, Oklahoma City is part of uh, what they call the Major City Chiefs Association. It's the, um, I believe it's 77 uh, largest agencies in the United States and Canada. And uh, um, just since 2019, it's very interesting. There's been like a, I want to say around a 75% turnover yeah. in uh, chiefs around the country. It's a difficult job. I mean, it, it right. really is. Yeah, it's, I mean, with everything, you know, and obviously technology, social media, like it's, it's not the job that it was 10 years ago. You know? No, and, and we talk about that all the time, you know, how accessible you have to be, how much you have to be out in the community and, you know, talking to people that were chiefs many years ago um, and, and talking to them about what I do now and how my day is there. They, you know, it was nothing like that right. uh, then. I mean, it's always been a tough job, but you're, you're right with the technology, the way it is and just um, things going on around the country. If something something can happen a thousand miles from here and it still have an impact on us even though we weren't involved in it because news and everything else is just accessible right now right yeah everyone's got a camera you've got mm-hmm. dash cams you've got personal body cameras you know it's yes yeah it's and then you know it all helps with evidence it goes both ways though right absolutely you know, you're like everybody's 
everyone's, you know, you're going to be on video at some point, right? And now, sadly, yeah. that's the thing. When someone gets pulled over, the first thing to think of is, oh, I'm going to get my phone out and video this just in case something bad happens. Right. Which is sad, though you have yeah. to deal with that and you have to deal with that stigma and overshadow that stigma too, right? You have to kind of overcome that from being a, you know, someone who effectively is, you know, serving the community. Absolutely. And, and, you know, of course, I, I watch a lot of videos of our officers uh, doing their jobs, and I'm, I'm truly amazed uh, at the patience they have now that, you know, a lot of us, when I first started this um, job, you know, we, we didn't probably have the patience for that back then. But, you know, they know everything they do is under a microscope, and they work really hard to not escalate things and, and it's pretty amazing to watch especially when you're looking at a 21 22 year old person who maybe is just out of college just out of the academy just out of training uh, it's amazing to me the maturity that they show and of course you know we're human we make mistakes too but i'm more often amazed at the great things they do uh, than i am the the mm-hmm. bad things that happen yeah yeah because like you said everyone makes mistakes we're human beings um but yeah it's harder to develop that patient skill Right over just saying one wrong phrase or just you know acting out of emotion and absolutely so yeah it's definitely harder to develop to do that. Um, so the police thing then taking it back to you growing up, <clears throat> do you have kind of family in law enforcement? What leads you into the idea that I'm going to be you know a, a public servant and go and be in law, law enforcement from a young age? So it's kind of interesting. Um, when I was a kid, I never really thought about it. Uh, I had a uh, cousin that was a police officer. Um, he started out in Houston, and then he was a police officer in uh, New Mexico, too, where most of my family. Um, I was born out in West Texas, and, and uh, so I had family. My mother's family was from a little town called Denver City. My dad's family was from a, a town called Hobbs, which is in New Mexico. Yeah, I know Hobbs is. Yeah. Um, and and my, so I had a cousin that was a police officer there. And I remember him, you know, coming over to my grandmother's house when we'd be out there visiting in uniform. And I thought it was cool, but I never really thought... I would want to do that. Um, my dad was also a police officer for a little while when he was finishing up college, but I, I, I was that was before you know I was born. I mean, I did I don't remember that at all. Uh, so there really wasn't much in my family as far as that goes. Uh, my family, you know, they're all in the oil business, um, and uh, that's kind of what we grew up around. Kind of what I thought I might end up doing, if not that, some type of business, because that's kind of where our background was. So. Uh, it's kind of interesting. And then uh, what, what actually turned me to law enforcement was uh, I'm, after I graduated high school, I went to OU, Oklahoma University. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, when I was a freshman there, my first semester didn't go very well. Um, away from home, I spent a little, little bit too much time, you know, hanging out at parties and mm-hmm. with friends. And then I did go into class. And I remember coming home after that first semester, my grades weren't that great. And I remember my mom and dad saying, you better find something that you're passionate about and uh, you better get this together and make good grades or, you know, we're not going to continue to pay for you to be in college. And I took a uh, um, elective course that next semester in political science that was a um, taught by a retired police officer. He'd been a police officer in Berkeley. I think he, I think he said he was a police officer in the 60s. And uh, um, so anyway, I took that class, was listening to his stories. I thought, this is pretty cool. And I ended up taking all of the classes that he offered and, and getting my political science degree with uh, emphasis on law enforcement administration. And that, that kind of had me hooked. Yeah. Why, uh, why owe you? You know, um, really the biggest thing is just as a kid, uh, I'm a huge OU football fan. Mm-hmm. remember watching OU Nebraska games and, and uh, just um, was always fascinated by the campus. Uh, thought it was, you know, just a, a great place. And, and at the time, too, they had a, a real good business school that I thought, you know, would be good. Um, of course, it turned out, too, they had a real robust political science uh, department with the law enforcement emphasis, too, which actually worked out better for me. But um, that was just kind of always my plan. I always wanted to go to OU, even as a kid. Yeah. Dan, didn't, did you play kind of sports growing up? Any intramural stuff at OU as well? I, I did. Stuff? I played a, a little intramural uh, yeah. football. We had a team that we, we uh, did a couple of years. One year when I was in the dorms, and then another year just a group yeah. of us got together, did that. Um, I played a little bit of football growing up. Um, and a uh, little bit of everything and, you know, was never yeah. that great at any of it. But uh, just uh, just that you'd like to do and play, mm-hmm. have camaraderie and hang out with your friends. And, and growing up in a, in a small town, um, that was just kind of, it was a good way to have something to do after school and, right. and be involved in. Yeah. What do you think about the SEC move? 
You know, um, I, I, th I get from the standpoint of why they're doing it. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that, you know, there won't be that uh, Bedlam rivalry anymore, but I felt the same way when Nebraska left uh, the Big 12 because that OU Nebraska rivalry was always yeah. huge too. I think from a, you know, from a standpoint of what it could do for the football team and the university, I mean, again, I get, I get why they're doing it. And I think in the long run, it'll be, it'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so too. You're right. Yeah. It's just, it's tough to get through those first couple of years, right? They're always the hardest. And then, Absolutely. you know, dealing with the naysayers and, and, you know, yeah, I think we'll miss, you know, OU OSU games. Um, obviously you're still going to have OU Texas. Yeah. Right. Which is kind of nice, but yeah, it's, um, Maybe just the OU OSU game will probably be a preseason game now, rather than a conference championship or you know a be, uh, what do you call it a Thanksgiving game. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, I mean it's 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 exciting for the state. I think. At a, oh, at I think so. Point. Yeah, and and you know I mean I have season tickets every year. We mm -hmm. we go to the games. We go to OU Texas. But I think it's just that part of that. You know we lost OU Nebraska. Yeah. Now we're going to use lose. Uh, OU OSU and yeah. like you said we still got OU Texas as a big rivalry right and maybe OSU will win some win some conference championships now that <laughs> OU has left uh, if TCU doesn't continue to rise like they did last year oh but, yeah yeah that's uh, I mean it's, it's all good it's all fine uh, so while you're at OU then and you kind of see this you know this opportunity to go political science and, and you're diving down the law enforcement route do you have any opportunities you know any kind of three-letter agency type people that come in to recruit fbi stuff like that you know because that's kind of what they do right they they come in and they whatever it is i have a guests on in the past that, that have said the same thing and um former governor uh, frank keating was the same way he was in an ou and that's how he got mm -hmm. recruited to go fbi i think it was um was there any kind of similar experiences for yourself? Did anyone come into class and talk to you? I, I do remember uh, that happening, and then they would set up. Uh, it, it seems like I remember them, uh, the federal agency, setting up like recruiting booths in uh, the union, um, and uh, I, I, I was interested in that. But the big thing is, um, I, I did an internship when I was a senior. Uh, at, at OU, and um, I did that with uh, the probation and parole, Oklahoma probation and parole. Uh -huh. uh, one of the probation officers that worked in that office had been a DEA agent before, uh -huh. and so I, I spent some time talking to her about that. And at that time, um, it was guaranteed if you were going to join the DEA or the FBI, you you weren't going to be in Oklahoma. They were going to send you, you know, New York uh -huh. or DC or DEA. They could send you out of the country too. So she talked to me a lot about that and. I just I wasn't interested in being that far away from home and yeah. away from Oklahoma, um, you know, where I'd grown up, and so it just uh, that that killed that pretty quick. Yeah, so just naturally a real homebody, and yeah, so didn't really want to be, you know, stationed somewhere else, right? Which makes yeah. sense why they'd want to send you somewhere, or, or have to move a lot, you know. Yeah. And that's what she said is that you know you get somewhere and you spend mm -hmm. a few years, and they're going to move you again. And you know, if you start thinking about, you know, at that age, I didn't have a family or anything, but mm -hmm. you think at some point you do want that, and is that how you want to raise a family? And, right. and it just it just didn't appeal to me. I mean, uh, there's a lot of guys I know that, that chose that route. Uh, we've had some of our officers that have left our department and done that's worked out very well for them, but it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. It wasn't what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. So, so during that time then, do you, want, you know, once you graduate, do you just go straight into you know, law enforcement and into working? To how that next transition goes. So what happened was when when I graduated, and I you know, and prior to that, um, actually at the end of my first semester, I, I knew I needed to start applying for jobs, okay. and so and I knew I, I, for me, I knew Oklahoma City was the biggest agency in the state, mm -hmm. um, and I wanted. Uh, the ability to have those opportunities that a large police department could offer, you know, that I wouldn't be stuck doing one thing. I would have opportunities to do other things and, of course, see a lot and uh, um, just, you know, ha have the, um, for me, there was a, an excitement about policing and I knew there'd be a variety of calls and things that I would have to deal with here in Oklahoma City. So in December, um, it was in December of 1988, I applied because I was going to graduate in May of 89. And so it was about probably um, March, April, somewhere around in there. I had completed everything up to going to a hiring board. I had done my polygraph. They had done my background, all of that. And then they called me and said, we have to stop everything. There's a hiring freeze. And uh, we, we don't know when that's, that's going to lift up. So it was getting closer to graduating. Um, I really didn't. 
you know, I felt like I'm about to have a college degree. I really don't want to, you know, move back home and then have to move again. And so I had a friend at the time um, that I, I was working with that was one of the probation officers that I was assigned to. He was only a couple of years older than me. He wasn't out of school very long. And um, uh, he had a really good friend that was a Chickasha police officer. And he said, hey, Chickasha is hiring. If you want to go down, get your feet in the door and get some experience. So I went down there and applied okay. and, and literally uh, walked across the stage. I don't remember the exact date, but I walked across the stage in uh, early May at OU, got my diploma, and I was at work at Chickasha the next night. Yeah. That's thrown in the deep end, right? It was. Straight it away. Was. No, uh, no it, time to enjoy, you know, the no. week off. <laughs> and it's very interesting. Um, you know, back then, uh, in those smaller agencies like that, there was no training at all. So my first night there, uh, they gave me a uniform. Um, and I put the uniform on. They gave me a gun that I had never shot. Uh, it, it, I remember, yeah, it was a revolver, and they handed it to me and made sure I had bullets, and they put me with another officer and sent me out. Uh, I was working graveyard shift. Yeah. Three nights later, um, I come in, you know, with my officer that I was riding with, and uh, the uh, lieutenant who was the shift um, over the shift. We had sergeant that was the first line supervisor, and the lieutenant was the shift commander. I walk in, and he looks at me, and he pokes me in the chest, and he goes, where's your vest? I go, what's a vest? I didn't know what he was talking about. He was talking about a bulletproof yeah. vest. And he goes, good gosh. He said, you've been working three nights without a vest. So he takes me back to a closet they had in the back and uh, kind of mills around. He goes, I think this will fit you. And it was too big, but I didn't care once right. I knew what it was. Yeah, exactly. I was like, yeah, give me a vest. <laughs> um, so, um, but I met a lot of great people down there, got a lot of great experiences. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, I came off a shift one night in, uh, I believe it was in August. Uh, no, it was in July. I get home, I'm about to go to bed, my phone rings, and it's the recruiter from the Oklahoma City Police Department. He said, hey, uh, we just got this three-quarter cent sales tax about to pass, um, and you know we're, our hiring freeze has been lifted, and you're, everything you've done in your packet, you're worked up, ready to go. If you're still interested, can you be down here this morning? So I changed clothes, took a shower, drove straight up there, and uh, I started the academy um, September 29th of 1989. Yeah. And what's really uh, really cool about that is our chief in Chickasha at the time was a retired Oklahoma City police captain, okay. um, which is like a major now. Back then, and they, were, they were captains, but it was a division commander. So he had been a pretty high rank with the police department. And I, I remember uh, I, I, telling my mom and dad, hey, I've got this job offer. I'm gonna have to tell the chief because he was about to send me to Cleet because I got to be honest with him. I don't want him to send me to Cleet and then me leave and go to Oklahoma City knowing that. And I said, you know, I was telling him, I, I may tell him this, and he said, you don't have a job. I may have to move back home. They're like, that's fine because we know you'll, you know, you'll start in September. That's all good. So I went in and I told him, and he was so appreciative of my honesty that uh, he said, you can stay here until you're ready to go. I won't send you to Cleet. I appreciate you telling me. He said, I understand. I, you know, worked in Oklahoma City, retired from there. Uh, greatest uh, guy's name was uh, Bob Hicks. Um, he was the chief at the time. And I'll never forget that conversation. And then, interestingly enough, a couple nights later, I'm on patrol with my officer that I'm riding with, and we find a guy deceased yeah. in a pickup. Um, and uh, no evidence, nothing, but we knew it was a homicide, and the ME ruled it a homicide. And so Chief Hicks said, I'm gonna let you shadow a detective and see how a homicide works. So here I am, uh, 22 years old. Yeah. Um, actually, I wasn't even 20, I was still 21 then. Uh, I said, I'm 21 years old, just out of college, no law enforcement experience, and now I get to shadow a detective and work a homicide. And we solved it. Uh, ended up you know, getting a guy put in prison over it. So I'll never forget that, um, yeah. you know, and that opportunity that, that uh, he gave me to still stay there and have a job. Right. Yeah, that's so uh, yeah, what an experience, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, like I said, it takes it takes someone, you know, just to 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 have the kind of long long view, right? The foresight to say, you know, this will this will benefit you in the future. You need to go through this, mm -hmm. and you know, it, and it also kind of sparks interest, right? And, and makes you more committed to the job. And there's so many ways to look at it, but that's uh, absolutely that's a really special moment and something obviously that kind of a, a high point. You know, it's something you look back at at a point in your career that was you know maybe a turning point, right? Oh, absolutely. And and you know, um, that was the interesting thing too. As I was about to graduate from OU, I took the LSAT. Uh -huh. Was planning planning on going to law school and, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, get some water. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, 
uh, you know, had, had told my family that I just want to do this police thing, you know, for about five years, get out of my system. And yeah. then I go back to law school. And I remember my mom telling me, you know, if you don't go to law school now, you'll never go. I was like, oh, pff, what do you know? You know, uh, I'll go back to law school and haven't been to law school yet <laughs> uh, and, and still doing police work. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 interesting how your plans and what you're going to do. And I think if I had stayed at Chickasha, I probably, if I wouldn't have been able to get the opportunity in Oklahoma City, I probably would have, you know, gone back to law school. Because I, again, I didn't want to leave the state. Oklahoma City was it for me. It was where I wanted to work. And so if that hadn't worked out, I probably wouldn't yeah. wouldn't be where I am today yeah. for sure. There is a <clears throat> previous guest on the podcast, uh, Colonel Stan Evans, who's Oklahoma Hall of Famer. Uh, he went to law school at age 53. Uh, and graduated wow. 57. So there's still time. There is time, uh, yes. You know, he's, uh, he's, I think he's the dean or assistant dean at OU Law Net right now. And, uh, That's awesome. Every time I meet him, it's just like, you know, he's in his 70s now, and he's just like, I should do more with my life, right? Like, you know, he's, that's what keeps so, you yeah, young. I mean, yeah, that's time. true. Uh, yeah, he. I think the day after he graduated, the, the dean made him assistant dean. <laughs> so, yeah, awesome. But, yeah, there's still time. So never say never, right? <laughs> that's right. Uh, so, yeah, you, 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 know, you start with Oklahoma City, kind of 89, 90, um, mm -hmm. and you just kind of, this is my career now. You kind of see it, and um, you get... Obviously, more formal, you know, formal training. You know, like I said, you didn't really get much training at Chickasaw, but yeah. then you you really get trained up, and you know, you have your weapons and everything else. And and I guess it's not just you know how do you shoot a gun straight. It's fitness and negotiating tactics. And I mean, there's so much to look at placing, you know, de-escalation or whatever it is, rather than just you know, hey, I'm a police officer, I drive a car, and I stop bad guys. You know. Yeah, and it was it was really um, it was eye opening number one, but it was really interesting. Um, as I'm getting this training, it made me more appreciative yeah. because uh, and and you know having started the way I did in Chickasha and just getting thrown out in the car. I mean, again, you're 21 years old and yeah. you know it's like no big deal. You're invincible and all that. But as I started learning stuff in the academy and they're teaching us things about safety and what to look for I'm thinking holy cow I knew none of this right. I mean and I think about I was thinking about situations I had been in where I know the officer I was riding with was queuing on these things and paying attention but I had no clue I mean you know um, so yeah I was I was very thankful uh, and then also too um, I was thankful for the, uh, the the position but also I was amazed at how much equipment they bought us, you know, because most other agencies at that time didn't do that. But they I, they pretty much gave us everything we needed uh, to do our job, and that was that was something to me that was it just I think it made me more appreciative yeah. um, of that, you know, just just having come from somewhere where um, I, I didn't have those opportunities. Yeah. So when you like I said you you decided, hey, I'm going to do this for five years, and then I'm going to go to law school, and obviously that that you know you're still being a police officer and. and ended up going into a career did anything change in those first five years that you're like you know hey this is a career for me now you know obviously you didn't go to law school so was there a moment that kind of said you know this is my calling this is where I need to be I don't need to get a law degree it's interesting with police work I hear people say all the time that you know the first year a little over a year of an officer's career is it's all training yeah. it's the academy it's um, FTO mm -hmm. you know then you're on probation and, and it's, they, you know, the, the saying is you really don't get your investment out of that officer until somewhere around that five-year mark. Um, of course, I didn't know that at the time, but, but I know that now. You know, it, it takes about that much before the officers are really capable and doing everything on their own. And for me, what I noticed, it was about year three. Um, I had been uh, assigned at the time I was riding. Um, at that time, it was a district called Adam Six, um, and it was just right over just a little bit west of here um, in the uh, near northwest part of downtown. Um, at that time, it's amazing now. It's a beautiful area. They're developing it, nice homes, all of that. But at that time, it was a, it was a pretty rough area. And I just remember, um, you know, like one night, it just kind of dawned on me that things were just happening right in front of me. And I was, you know, catching bad guys doing crazy things, stolen cars, selling drugs, weapons, you know, all of those things. And, and I remember telling my supervisor, I said, man, it's really weird. These people are doing stuff right in front of me. He goes, it's not them, it's you. He said, you now have learned enough. You know where to be. You know where 
you're supposed to be to intercept criminal behavior and, yeah. and, and take these people off the streets. So it's not them that are doing things in front of you. You're in the position to make that happen. And I remember thinking, that's, that's really cool. I mean, you know, this, this is, this is great. And I would go home at night feeling very rewarded at yeah. what I was doing. And, um, uh, you know, just that, that feeling of helping people, not just with that, but right. things like you, you go into a home and there's little kids in there and they're by themselves and they don't have food and you could do something like maybe buy some food or, or get them out of a bad situation. I remember that was really um, cool to me too, you know, just that you just went home at the end of the night and, and it never was the same. You know, every night was different. Um, but probably the biggest thing for me that that steered me for good where I knew this is where I was supposed to be was the bombing. Um, I had, I had, well, I had about five years on the street then, um, but I had been on about six years when that happened. Um, not quite six years, but getting close uh, to that when that, when that happened and going down and responding to that. Um, I think it really changed things because that also too, there, there wasn't a person in this city that wouldn't stop you and thank you and I mean, even though, you know, I, I don't feel like I had very much to do with it, but I think all of us kind of felt that way in some sense. But it just made me realize that this, there's not another job out there that's going to make me feel as good as this. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it goes a long way. Kind of probably goes back to that experience to try doing that detective, right? And being successful and, and solving that and being a part of that or just witnessing it and then you know you're on your own or you're out on the road and you know you're, you're being successful it's it's not just punching a clock and getting a paycheck every day and driving around and having a presence it's making a difference right and that's yes. kind of like you said you get that fulfillment in it and you know once you get that fulfillment and you see you making a change especially if it's kids or, or you know around families and you know women and children that you know that it goes a long way right like that's kind of you know, and it's not an ego thing it's just I mean, I am making a difference here. Right? Yes. I want to get up in the morning and get to work and make a difference again. Uh, and I'm sure there's been tough times where you haven't. You haven't felt like that. I mean, what, a couple of years ago when all the riots were going on and the stuff you mentioned, you know, social media and stuff happening around the state and, you know, people are seeing law enforcement as bad things, you know, and all the other stuff has gone to social media and, you know, it just takes one person to probably during that time to roll the window down and just say, yeah, I appreciate you guys, right? Absolutely. You know, very little thing too. I mean, when you think about... Um, you know uh, the the sour you make and those other things. You, you those those uh, uh, feelings of making a difference are even more important. You know yeah. because there there's not many jobs that that you can look back and say that and you can go. Now again, I had nights too where I came home and was like, I wish I, I don't want to ever do that again or experience <laughs> yeah. that again. You see something that is just horrible. You know, um, but also too during those times and people would ask me. Uh, a lot, you know, um, that, that were outside law enforcement. They go, how do you, they, you deal with all the yeah. negative stuff you see? And I said, well, what happens is I end up feeling more blessed. You know, I, I would come home thinking that I've never had to experience something like that or no one in my family has had to experience something like that. Um, and so, you know, that's that's how you kind of get through those times sure. too. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sure in your time, you know, since 89, 90, getting involved up to now, the kind of services uh, that are available you know, around mental health and just talking about it in groups are a lot more than you probably had in the start, right? You've got more people there and <clears throat> more, there's less stigma around that as well, right? So, you know, probably earlier on in your career and, and most guys I think suffer from this, you know, you're young, nothing, you know, I, I'm never going to talk about it, I don't need it, but you really need to talk about it. If you've seen something, you know, yes. some of the things you guys have seen, you know I mean? And we don't have to talk about it on the podcast because I think people listening would wince because it's, it's horrific, the things that you see. You know, sadly, the stuff that you got to go through. Um, but I'm interested to hear how it has evolved over time with mental health and the the stuff that's available to you guys. So um, we, we I, I remember very early on that we had a chaplain um, for the police department, and I remember um, him being being around us a lot and just talking to us and things. I never looked at it, and I don't think it was anything developed at that point as mental health, but it's more like just checking on us, seeing how we're doing, praying for us, those kind of things. Um, but I, I remember after the bombing, um, they made all of us, we had to attend a, and it was group sessions, it wasn't one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, I, I don't remember, but I want to say maybe there was 10, 20 of us in a room with a counselor, and they just had us go around the room and talk about you know what we'd seen, what we thought about, what we experienced about the bombing, and I remember being real resistant to that. I did not want to 
and I didn't open up hardly at all in a, in a group like that setting because I didn't want anybody to think I was bothered by any of that. Or And I, I bet you most of the people in the room did that same thing. But that was the first time that we had any of that. And I remember being mad because I was made to go to it. Um, but, and also too, you know, there was that, um, for lack of a better term, like that, the bravado of it. I don't need that. Why are they making me go yeah. to that? And so, you know, fast forward now, um, when I first became chief, uh, we, we had evolved over the years and we had a program um, for officer wellness, but it was, it was one person, yeah. one person and a chaplain. And then there was a group of volunteers with it too. And I remember sitting down with that individual when I first became chief and he was telling me about all the things he was doing. I was like, I, I don't know how you're doing this and there's no way you're keeping up with what our needs are. And so I remember I met with... Um, my command staff and I said, we, we've got to make a change here to what we're doing, but I do not have the knowledge to do it. I'm not a counselor. I'm not trained in that. So um, one of my deputy chiefs at the time had, uh, um, I can't remember how he had met them, but it was through some training or something he had done. Um, he met a guy that was a former chief in Aurora, Colorado, and his wife was a um, a counselor, I don't remember what her exact title was, if she was a psychologist or what, but they formed a company after he retired, and it was called, uh, Code, I think it's called Code 4, Code 4 Counseling. Um, and uh, we con uh, contracted with them as a consultant, and they came in and really got us to where we are today. We have a full-time wellness staff. Um, it's four people. I have an LPC on staff and um, I've got a host of volunteers. We just hired a chaplain. Uh, and that was another thing too, our chaplaincy program, <clears throat> excuse me, our chaplaincy program had been a sworn police officer. And in some ways that's good, but I wanted someone that was, you know, trained um, yeah. in the uh, in the ministry and, and had come up with that. And so we recently hired a chaplain uh, mm -hmm. to do that. And then not only that, it was very interesting. You know, you talk about the difference, uh, the differences now um, in people wanting that help. We, yeah. we have, it's one of those things, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. We have a lot that come for help now. And the, the stigma, it still may be there a little bit, but it's going away, especially yeah. with the younger generation. They're a lot more open right. about this. It's normal for them. They're, they're not, you know, as, as closed off. But that LPC, when he first started, I thought it's going to take him a year yeah. before these cops are going to accept him. And Nope. Within about the first week, people were coming in. He's got almost more than, than he can do right now. So it's, it's really changed. It's evolved. I love seeing it. Um, I love seeing our officers willing to go and get help. We have, uh, if an officer is involved in a critical, critical incident, whether it's an officer involved shooting and custody death or they've just seen something that's really bad, we have processes for them to go through to get help. They can get paid wellness leave. Um, so they don't have to use their own time to do that. I mean, again, it's it's uh, it's much more more robust than it ever was. Yeah, it makes sense, right? Yeah. You know, and and you're right. Kind of early on, everyone's kind of you know it's seen as a stigma. It's seen as I'm showing weakness if I go do this. You know, and and some you know some people might look at it as if I go to go do this, I'm risking my job, right? Yes. You, know, you might get like, oh, people can't trust me. I'm not reliable. I've got mental health issues. They might fire me or whatever it is, right? And, and I think now, like you said, I'm glad that it's, you know, it's such a critical part because, you know, and I th also think, obviously, the society has evolved so much in 30 years, you know, since the 90s and with social media and videos and more pressure just on you guys in general. Like, even if just pulling someone over for a busted taillight, like, there's so much stuff that is more, you know, kind of around that rather than if it was 30 years ago. You know, it's just... You guys do a lot of stuff. You don't get paid enough for it. I probably don't get enough appreciation for it, but I'm glad that you, you know, that is there because, you know, it's it's obviously worth its weight in gold and it's kind of the time that, that you know, the, the resources and the money that's been put into it is clearly worth everything that you get um, out of it, uh, you know, and, and no doubt there's been people in it who have probably prolonged their career because of that, right? Oh, yeah. Um, it, it is is code for like badge down, I'm out? Is that kind of where it's named after? It just means everything's okay. Oh, okay. You know, if you say code for, everything's good. What's the opposite then? Because there is a code for like, hey, I'm done here. Like, right? Isn't that? Are you talking about like going out of service, uh, 10 7? You know, yeah. we, we say that when we're going out had, of service. I had a friend of mine who was kind of in police force and he said, if you see something horrific and you're just like, it's code whatever, I'm like, 
badge down, guns down. I'm never doing this ever again. I don't oh. know what that was. Most people call that code brown, yeah. <laughs> but in the police system, it's probably something different. Well, uh, and I think it could be similar to what, you yeah. know, because when, when we say 10 7, we're out of service. Okay. Or, that's you know, when, when we're retired and do our final call, we say sure. we're 10 7. Okay. Maybe, um, so may, maybe that's the yeah. same thing. Because I was yeah. talking to him, and, and he's kind of he's not a police officer but he has a friend one of his best friends is and he, they you know share stories and he said that one of his colleagues had seen something that was so bad that that night he's like never doing this again I need a new job yeah. which happens sadly it does um, yeah. and, and that's why too that wellness team is so important um, we, we have uh, it, it's an email that goes out across the entire department it's called a significant incident and so um, uh, there's certain criteria that meet that. And so supervisors will do those significant incidents. And so say uh, that that the night before, um, officers had to respond to a child death and they did CPR on the child, were unable to save him, um, something like that. Then our, our wellness team, they monitor that. And when they see something like that, they're gonna go out to that division and that lineup the next night, make sure everybody's uh, doing okay. And um, it's, it's just to, you know, kind of what we've learned is over the years in law enforcement, people would look at if you're involved in something real traumatic like an officer involved shooting or, you know, re you respond to some large incident, the tornadoes, for example, you see a lot of, you know, things out of that Two people hurt or, or killed something real big like that. You think, oh, my gosh, that's that's really bad. We got to get those officers some help. What we've learned now over probably about the last 10 years or so is that the cumulative trauma can sometimes be worse. Yeah. So for example, you have an officer who may maybe has never been involved in a shooting, but over 10, 15 years, they've seen more trauma, you know, right. triple what up. the average person sees in a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we, we try to address as well. We, we even um, recently implement, implemented a program where um, alcohol is a big problem for cops. They, they use that to, to deal with a lot of the stresses. And sometimes, you know, sleeping, things like that, they think, well, if I drink, I can go to sleep. And, and so we start to see that and, and addictions to alcohol. And in the past, what you'd see is that start to impact their, um, their attendance at work. So they're abusing their leave, uh, taking off, and, and they run out of leave, and they're to a point, you know, they're at the bottom. They're drinking too much to probably function, and, and, but they won't go get help because most of the, that help's going to be long-term, 30 to 60 days. So we recently instituted a program where if an officer will come to us before they get in trouble, um, you know, like before they get a DUI or something like that and say, I need help, um, we will do that. And even if they're out of leave, we'll put them on paid leave. And we've seen some really big success. And it's, and it's interesting because when we first started that um, program, I had quite a few officers take advantage of that, and it, and it concerned me. So I called another chief from another major city because I knew he had a program similar to that. And I go, hey, I've had you know this many guys, um, this many officers come to me and say, I need help, and we've, we've got it to him. He goes, man, that's great. I go, no, I'm a little concerned. He goes, well, you shouldn't be. He yeah. said that, that means they're taking advantage of it, and they're getting help before they get in trouble. So I had to kind of sit back and, and take that perspective of, yeah. You know, it's good because I probably would have lost that many officers. Right. Something would have happened, and they would have lost their job. Yeah. Um, and so, anyway, it's it's just interesting to me how that program has come, all of wellness in general. Mm -hmm. But now that we have folks that are willing to come and say, "Hey, I, I mean, if they if you'd have done that when I first started, yeah. a matter of fact, uh, I had an officer on my shift who was out of, I think he was out of two academies before me that had a drinking problem, and and they just fired him. Yeah. I mean, he was gone. They they didn't try to do anything to help him or anything like that so it's it's good to see where we've come yeah now yeah definitely uh moving is that mine somebody it's mine <laughs> <laughs> uh moving kind of things you know along and, and just you know you you mentioned the bombing and having that that having such an impact on your career and obviously a couple of weeks ago a few weeks ago you know we had the oklahoma city marathon um you know i i love the marathon it's it, it's just Every time I get to invite someone to the city and have them do it and just ask for their reaction, right? Even if they just do the 5K, the half mm -hmm. round, whatever it is, just being there to cheer, just hearing if they've ran marathons in the past, they come to Oklahoma City, they get, you know, they, they're crossing the finish line in tears, right? Yeah. And, and it's not, and they have no relation, realize, they have no relation to, you know, Oklahoma City or just the events of that day, but just the overwhelmingness and the support for that event. 
and you know it's obviously a huge operation for your side. Oh yeah. You know, so uh, you know everyone knows like the marathon side of things, but people don't know about your the, your side of it. Because you're closing down streets at mm-hmm. five thirty six o'clock in the morning, and so what is that like being in your role as a you know chief of Oklahoma City Police and having that event? You know, planning all the way up to it. You know, with with the marathon with Carrie and the whole you know board there and, and getting the event planned and just the the scale of this event that means so much to Oklahoma City what's that like being in your role during that event it it really is a labor of love and and um you know, if you ask my my staff that's directly involved in that, you know, I'm sure they'll tell you there's a lot of headaches with it, and they do. And I, I talk to them regularly as they're planning, but it, it is a year long planning, um, and, and it takes a lot of police officers um, to make that happen. And we have to bring people in on their days off and other things. For the for the most part, though, um, even officers that are new, uh, they they volunteer for that. And, and uh, when I say volunteer, they're getting paid. Don't get me wrong, but but they volunteer for that assignment, and they just love it because um, the people are so supportive when they run past you. You know, you're encouraging them for running, but they're encouraging and thanking you. And and there's just uh, when I go out there and and I roam around the the course um, and listen to the radio and just make sure everything's going good. Um, I, I don't run into any officer that's grumpy or anything like that. They're very happy to be there and do it. And I remember. Um, um, uh, the first time they ran that marathon, uh, me and a group of, of officers, we, we got a relay team together and ran it. And we did that for several years. And uh, I just remember like seeing the names um, of you know someone who had died uh, as a result of that act and, and seeing those names on those bibs. And of course, I recognize those names, but just thinking, what, what an honor, you know, how, how cool is that, that these people, and there are a lot of people, just average everyday people, that probably, you know, it took everything they have to train and run that marathon, but they'll do it no matter what the pain and finish it. It's just a, it's a really neat event. Uh, and interesting uh, um, story, you know, we, we went out and uh, um, this year is doing, you know, just running the course. I mean, driving around and, and doing what I normally do and just kind of talking to officers and other things out there. And I stopped at this one point point. there was a young man that was, that was working there. Um, it wasn't an officer and it was one of the, uh, he probably was a volunteer, but anyway, I was talking to him and, and he said, how long do you have to be out here? I said, oh, I get to be out here. I don't have to be out here. And I think that's the way uh, most of the officers feel. Um, and uh, it's just a really neat experience. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people were running past me and saying, thank you for all you do and appreciate you. And of course, they're doing it to everybody, all the officers on that course. So it's a it's a real neat experience. I'm, I'm so glad that that's something that the um, the memorial, you know, the foundation and the, the group that that runs that, that they came up with that idea and they do it. And, and it takes a lot of work on their part every year, too. And and so I just I'm grateful that they do it. Yeah, it's, it's you have to be, you know, it's if people listening haven't been involved in it, like you can be involved in it. And this year, for the first time this year, I had uh, kind of a cheer section. We had like a This Is Oklahoma branded cheer section out here by the Hall of Fame. And it's the first time I've ever done that. My wife ran the full, I did the full last year. And, you know, running is totally different, right? Like you're, you're, in the pain cave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's, yeah. You know, but you're, you're right. Like people are going through that, you know, because, you know, to, to remember, right. You know, run to remember is, is the kind of tagline and, you know, they're not, they're not thinking about themselves. They're thinking about, I'm doing this for a reason, uh, mm-hmm. whether it's raising money, you know, or just running, but it was such a great experience being on the route all day, just kind of, I mean, just feeling the energy. And I was very surprised. We were out there. We started at 6.30. You got set up. <clears throat> and I was surprised that it only took us 45, 30 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour before we saw the first runner. Like, they are fast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so They're in a full-on sprint. Those, those ones in the front, I watched them. I'm yeah. like... There's no way I could keep, I could barely keep that up to the end of the driveway. Yeah, I mean, and there, it's, it's amazing. It's You're amazing. right. It's, it's, it's fun to watch. It really is. Yeah. And kind of to that point as well, like you, you know, it's not just the police department that you work with EMTs with fire. What's that like kind of just, <clears throat> cause one of the things I think people look at, you know, law enforcement in the, in America, in Oklahoma and, and just in general is there's so many different departments and agencies right and sometimes you know maybe you see in a movie or you see on a tv show whatever it is like you know obviously on tv shows and movies it's different but like 
it seems like you guys work together a lot easier than they portray it in movies, right? You know, yeah. like, you, you know, some, some of the police stuff you see in movies is like the FBI comes in and they're taking over or whatever, you know, you don't, you know, it's like that internal battle. But interested kind of what it's like as a chief of police for Oklahoma City when, you know, you do have a big case or you do have a big incident happen and DEA might come in, you know, with, especially with the, the marijuana stuff we have in Oklahoma, right? You're mm -hmm. dealing with a lot of that. And what's that like, you know, with bigger agencies? And have you ever thought that, you know, that's something that you, you know, maybe want to do later in life now that you know you're especially if you would be assigned in Oklahoma and not travel around the country what's that like you know um, well first of all you know I always say I, I'm I'm employed by the greatest department in the country in the greatest city and uh, you know I'm i tell this to people all the time when I leave this job I'm not going to take another one you know in law enforcement I'd be disappointed because uh, I just think Oklahoma City is so great and our people are so supportive uh, you know it's just a great community great place to work but um, it, it is interesting it's nothing like what you see on TV and, and I know I, I talked to chiefs from some other major cities and they do have some of those issues yeah. but we are very blessed here um, that's one of the things when I first became chief that uh, me and all of my staff you know very much so I said we have to focus on our relationships. You know, we're authorized at 1,235. We haven't been at that since I've been chief. Even before uh, anything that happened in 2020 and we saw more retirements and less people applying, we haven't been fully staffed in a long time. So you think about, we cover 621 square miles. This city is growing. Used to that 621 square miles, there's a lot of it that there just wasn't anybody there and that's not hardly the case anymore. And so, um, I say all the time that we need our federal partners, we need our uh, uh, other metro agencies that we work around. Yeah. And so we, we meet regularly, we have what's called a Metro Chiefs meeting, but in that Metro Chiefs meeting, we have representatives from the FBI, from the ATF, I mean, all of the uh, um, federal agencies. And we have officers that are, um, uh, what are called task force officers, TFOs, that have federal cred credentials. So if we start working a case and it expands gotcha. beyond that, they have jurisdiction to work those. And so I, I Oklahoma City Police Department could not do what it does without those partners. And then you talk about, you know, fire, IMSA. Um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, as a patrol officer that I was on a call by myself and fire department shows up um, and ended up having to help me, you know, get out of a fight or, or take somebody into custody or just, just be there just for that help and support. And so um, also, too, if, if any of us get hurt, we know those EMTs or, or they, that are with fire or IMSA are going to be there helping us. And so it really is a great um, relationship. And of course, police and firefighters, we, we rib each other all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, when we have Chief, to. Yeah. yeah. When, anytime me and Chief Kelly are at an event, if I'm speaking, I take a shot. If he's yeah. speaking, he takes a shot. But it's all in good fun. We're, we're good friends. Um, and I think if, if any agency, law enforcement agency or anything, uh, is arrogant enough to believe they can handle everything going on in their city yeah. by themselves. Uh, they're just that. It's right. arrogant. Yeah. You, you have to have that. You and, have to have those and partnerships. And the fight department usually first guys to show up, right? Oh, yeah. Generally, yeah. the first guys for any 99 call or whatever it is, like, fire is always first to go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I joke, a friend of mine who, uh, he's on the, lo on the second century board here at Oklahoma uh, Hall of Fame, he... Was a law, he was a lawyer, he was a law student. Uh, did corporate law for a long time, and now he's works for Oklahoma City Fire. He just finished school, he, like, he started, his first day was the day of the marathon. Wow. And I joke with him, like, you know, like, when's your calendar coming out? What month are you in the calendar? <laughs> when, how many cats have you rescued today? Yeah. yeah. Kind of thing, but it's, uh, it is amazing when you kind of get, hear those, you know, those, those in-house stories of, you know, the, just the scale of things you guys do. And obviously we had massive grass fires a couple of, what, what about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. Um, yeah, you know, and, and even that awesome. now, you know, we've got, uh, um, uh, helicopters yeah. and um, we're the uh, only agency in this area besides OHP that has the Oklahoma Highway Patrol which yeah. has um, helicopters and aircraft and so we recently um, I think it's been about a year or two now that we started first looking at that but we recently have started utilizing our helicopter mm -hmm. to help the fire department um, you know, on those wildland fires and yeah. we actually have a, a, a fire officer in our aircraft that's our um, you know, basically our crew chief on that and helping us with that. And it's been a wonderful partnership. Um, yeah. I think it's good for the city. We're, we're in the process of getting a third aircraft so that we can make sure we're available to mm -hmm. do those. And um, so it's just, it's just a great partnership. And, and again, um, I couldn't do anything without, and, that, and that's the thing too, when you even look at your local and state partners, um, 
the, the people that commit crimes in Oklahoma City, they're committing them in Tulsa. They're committing yeah. them in Bethany, War Acres. So, you know, if you don't work together yeah. and think crime stops at your city limits, I mean, you're, you're not going to be successful. Yeah. It's so, everywhere. That's why absolutely. you guys have a job. Right? <laughs> job security, Sadly, yeah. Sadly, it is everywhere. Yeah. And, and whether it's, you know, like somebody stealing something from a store or just, uh, you know, uh, just harassment or abuse or whatever it is, like, you're, you know, you guys are, are there to do everything. And, um, you know, naturally, people people think of, of shooting right that's like the first thing that people think of and buzzwords and and just what's in the media and you know the media is fueled by negativity you know that's mm -hmm. that's what fuels eyeballs and shares and social media whatever it is but at the end of the day there is so much more that you guys do not just arresting people and car chases you know it's um yeah, I mean, we could sit here for 10 hours and talk about the things that you guys oh, do. Oh, yeah, and, and the discussion all across the country is, you know, why are we sending police officers to do this and that, and we need to get them out of that business, and we don't disagree. I mean, mm -hmm. it's gotten to where people call 911 for everything. Yeah. Um, I, I had a, a member of the community one time that, that I was sitting down with, and, and he, he said it very well. He said, why are we calling the police for things my grandmother used to handle, you know? Yeah. And, it, and it's true. Um, so, you know, you won't get any argument out of us when, when you look at alternative responses and, yeah. and things like that. I mean, we need to be there. We need to be a part of society um, to keep people safe. But at the same time, there's a lot of things that we do that yeah. we shouldn't be. Right. Does the, grow, you know, kind of going through this, this process and, and, you know, being in law enforcement 30 plus years now, you know, with Oklahoma City, does the little boy in you ever think that I want to be a highway patrolman and chase bad guys in cars, <laughs> right, and do police chases? Uh, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I never really thought about that, but yeah. when, when I was a kid um, I, in southern Oklahoma where I grew up, troopers were kind of it, you know, they mm -hmm. were like... That, that was really cool when you saw a trooper. Yeah. And I remember um, one of my first jobs I had was I was a busboy at a restaurant uh, in Ardmore. And there was, uh, troopers would always come in there, you know, because um, especially late, that was a 24 hour restaurant. And I just remember, you know, talking to them and, and uh, talking about stuff they did. And, and of course I loved Southern Oklahoma. So there was a little bit of me that I thought um, that might be what I would want to do and stay in that part of the state. Yeah. But I also thought in looking at that and listening to what they said, that they were, there, it was just more um, diverse being a, an, a city police officer, the things that you deal with and the magnitude of things and stuff like that. So uh, there, there probably was a little bit of me at one point that thought, man, that'd be really cool. But yeah. as I got older and I really learned more about law enforcement, um, for me, I just felt like mm -hmm. a, a municipality, a large municipality was the place to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they do look cool, right? It, <laughs> it seems that the only exercise they do in the gym is biceps because they've all got <laughs> massive arms and like they're all kind of you know uh, yeah big big guys and it's uh yeah i mean it, it is it's kind of a it looks like a glamorous job right it's probably not but you know what you see on media and social media is you know these guys are doing car chases and doing drug busts and whatever it is um and i know it takes a lot more it, the, the training for local for ohp is is quite a quite a more significant to Oklahoma City Police, right? It's like a... No. You, it's not? No. I, I it's, it was like, we it was we like all have more. the same guidelines with CLEAT. Got you. Um, we actually exceed those guidelines. Uh, okay. Our academy is 20, 27, 28 weeks now. Um, I, I think OHP, they have a very lengthy academy too. Sure. Um, so yeah, I would say us, Tulsa, any any agency that runs their own academy yeah. um, is, is getting a lot of training before before they go yeah. out. Um, you know, the, the, the thing is, I think you know, for those troopers, a lot of times um, they are by themselves. And, and yeah. I think that's a, that's a big thing to think about too. You get out in some of these rural areas mm -hmm. um, and, and I think I have a lot of respect for them because they still have to do the job, right. uh, but they, you know, they call for backup. It's not there. It, it's the thing about here in Oklahoma City, you call for backup, it's here pretty quick. Yeah. So, so I think from that standpoint, um, it's it's a, a little bit tougher job. And I can tell you, too, when I was working in uh, Chickasha, uh, I was working graveyard shift. We, we had some nights, we had two, maybe three officers working the entire city. And, you know, those troopers were our backup, too, there. So um, it, it's interesting, I think, depending on where you are, kind of what... Um, you know, what's needed in the community. Um, and I think everybody kind of steps up with that role too. And, and we're, uh, we have very good relationships with uh, the Highway Patrol. We do a lot of uh, things together, our tactical units and, and those kind of things. So, so yeah, I mean, I think we're all, 
um, you know, we, we're all in it together. And, and really, all, any department now, it's so much different when, like, you know, when I jumped in a car that one night without training all those years ago, uh, it's very different now. I mean, training is a really big component of every law enforcement agency. Finishing up, uh, two questions. Uh, first one, what is the stuff like that... Um, just stuff that you were just unaware of getting into it, maybe misconceptions or things that just, you know, you look back and you're like, oh, I was just kind of blind to that. But now it, it's so clear to me. Is there anything that stands out like that from the position that you're in? Is it, you know, I guess you're in the media a lot, right? Since being the chief. Mm -hmm. so is there anything that comes from being in the media that you probably didn't think of that now you're fully aware of? Uh, so you're talking about as chief? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, when you talk about media, uh, I have gained a lot more respect mm. uh, for the media. Now, now, sometimes, you know, it's easy to get frustrated with them sure. um, when they, they do a story and those kind of things. But I don't, I don't know that there's any um, or very many jobs out there where um, people are, it, it's kind of like law enforcement. They're very dedicated mm -hmm. to what they do, uh, but they work a ton of hours. The pay for a lot of them isn't that great, um, but they still do it. And and I've met and talked to a lot of reporters, and I just gain a lot of respect. And a lot of times you see somebody on TV, and I think it's a lot like our job, yeah. where that you make a judgment based off you know something they say or whatever, something real silly that you're like I I don't like that person, and then you, you realize that you're you're doing the same things that you get frustrated about as a police officer, especially as a police chief, and. Uh, um, you know, and you realize too, those really are good people. And I think the relationship that I try to have with the media is, um, you know, it, it's okay to question us, critique us, any of that. I don't mind, but I just don't. I think there's a line there where you try to dramatize or um, um, you're, you're trying to get that aha or gotcha. And, and I'm just very honest of, you know, you ask me a question, I'm going to answer it unless it's something by law I can't answer. But at some point, you know, when that works its way out, I'll give you your answer. Yeah. And I think that helps is just being transparent and open. Um, but at the same time, I think that's the biggest thing for me is I've just, I've gained a, a very, um, uh, very much a, a respect mm -hmm. for those in the media for what they do. Yeah, you're right. I think it's so easy to just kind of fire off a tweet about, you know, the color of someone's power tie. Think of David Payne, it's storm season, right? What he said tonight, you know, if there's a storm and, you know, I mean, it's so easy to do because we all yeah. do it. But yeah. it's different when you're, when you're that person, right? And people, yeah. you know, and you're reading comments, which is the worst thing to do because, you know, if you meet those people in person, they're probably going to shake your hand and say thank you. They're not going to, fire off a tweet or a comment being hateful they just it's easier when they're sat in their own room on their phone right it's sad yeah and, and they attack you more at a personal level yeah. and i've noticed that too as chief i mean yeah. there, there's people in this community that are constantly negative against me i've never had a conversation with they've never sat down with me um and i find that interesting too you know they talk like they know you and you're this this evil person um but but they do that a lot to the folks in the media too yeah. uh so um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, what the answer is other than we all have to work together yeah. um, and we have to respect that. And again, I can't get mad or frustrated if they ask me a question I don't like, yeah. because if we especially if if we made a mistake or did something we shouldn't have, I, I need to stand up and take accountability right. for that. Um, but I'll also stand up and defend our folks when yeah. they're right, too. And I think most of them. Uh, understand that um, and it, it's it's been interesting because I'm not going to tell you I don't get frustrated sometimes um, you know but at the same time I just have such a better understanding of it right yeah uh, last question kind of a fun one what are the best perks about being chief of police do you get you know are you able to kind of like flick on the blues and get traffic get through traffic anywhere you want to go do you get free food anywhere like you get a key to the city like in the Simpsons I mean you know what what uh, what are the perks that just kind of you know just lighthearted stuff that you can kind of joke about you know, it's it's funny you say that because I get asked that a lot, and yeah. I, I I tell people and they don't believe me. There really are none. I mean, it's not like like I, I even uh, have joked around before, and I thought at least I ought to be able to play golf free at a city golf course or right. something. But no, I mean none of that. Um, and 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 I'll be honest too, I I don't like that. Sure. I always feel guilty. Yeah. Um, I, I try not to eat out too much because if I do, people want to buy my lunch and stuff. And I always feel guilty about that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would say the perks of it 
are for me it's just that I get to represent the city um, a lot and and I had uh, um, someone at major cities uh, recently we were at a major cities meeting and they were talking about the influence that we have as police chiefs and I never really thought about it but they said you know you think about a lot of the they named off a lot of different government officials they said you know they can say something and it probably draws some attention but uh, if you say something and um, they said people listen to it and they really um, gravitate towards that and I have kind of noticed that which means you got to be careful what you say too but at the same time as a representative of the city um, you know I've, I've I feel like that's that's pretty good and, and there's you know there's a lot of places I go where you, you see somebody you wish you hadn't seen um, I don't like being recognized but now it's very hard not to but for the most part when I am recognized, um, people are coming up and saying very positive things. And so I think, you know, from a perk standpoint for me, uh, that's that's pretty good. But I, I really, you know, like people think I get free tickets to the Thunder game or something. I don't, <laughs> you know, none <laughs> yeah. of that. Um, and, and I'd feel guilty if I if I sure. did get any of that because that's just not it's not my nature. Most police officers, are, we don't want to, you know, get anything for free. But but it's funny. You're you're not the only one that asks that. Yeah. I get asked that all I, the time. I figured that would be kind of a fun oh yeah to do yeah because it's um, I was I was at uh, there was a concert last night uh, at the Jones Assembly and I was there and uh, the guy that I was with was very good friends with two of the police officers that were there mm. and you know we were walking out and his buddy came over and I'm like you got the best gig ever you get a free show to see this guy rock <laughs> out at the Jones and then as we're leaving he's directing traffic I'm like I get to go home right now you've probably got another five hours of your shift tonight <laughs> so you know I guess it comes you know there's good things and bad things that happen yeah. but, um, and, and I know when I was a young officer um, and we had concerts coming here I'd do everything I could to try to work oh, those yeah. on and you know even though you're working and you got to yeah. be on your feet and of course if something happens you got to deal sure. with it but I remember getting to listen to the Eagles and Aerosmith and right. stuff like that and, yeah. and uh, you know, you couldn't just sit there and, and like enjoy the concert. You had to pay what was going on, but you were still there. You're you there. got to hear the music and yeah. and that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, it's it can, it can be pretty cool. But again, you're you're working, yeah. and, and like you said, everybody goes home and you're still there. That's kind of what he said. Is he was like, look, I'm working, but also like I got to meet the artists. Like we went, you know, we were backstage, yeah. got to see yeah. everybody, and you kind of get to, I guess, you know, geek out a little bit if it's someone like the sure. Eagles that you love or someone coming through town, and yeah. you know, you're meeting people that you might not get the opportunity to meet up close. You know, with Without spending a lot of money to get a VIP pass, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, and they appreciate you because they they know you're there to help safety and everyone have a good time and all the other things. But um, yeah, I want to thank you so much for taking an hour of your day to come out, share some stories. Uh, it's been a pleasure to you know to to give you the opportunity to share stories. It means a lot to come on the podcast. And if there is anyone out there that, that is listening, that is interested in joining uh, the Oklahoma City Police Force, then we'll put a link in the description. They can go to that and fill out whatever it is they need to do. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for your time. And, and I appreciate that. You know, people ask all the time, what's the biggest issue we're dealing with? And it's not just us. It's all around the country. We're 215 officers down um, and we need good folks. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, we're, we're recruiting heavily right now so and it's my pleasure to be here this has been kind of fun to reminisce and think about how things started and where i am today because i definitely did not think i would be chief of the oklahoma city police department one day <laughs> not at all uh, so I, I thank you for the opportunity yeah awesome uh well yeah thanks so much for people listening i'll like i said post the link in the description and uh, we will catch you next episode cheers Hope you guys enjoyed that great episode. Thank you so much for listening. As always, huge shout out to our sponsors, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, share an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram for daily updates at oklahomahof. Our other sponsor, the Chickasaw Nation, amazing sponsor they do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in oklahoma they're a huge supporter of oklahoma and without their support we wouldn't be able to do what we do and our third sponsor is diffie ford lincoln down in el reno now this one makes me so happy because these guys are great friends of mine um play a lot of golf together i've bought my cars from them do most of my oil changes down there, have a cup of coffee, hang out down in El Reno. It's a good spot to go. And not only are they great friends, but they provide a great service. So for over 60 years, a third generation family owned Oklahoma business down in El Reno. They're also in Bethany as well. So people in the Bethany area know the Diffies really well. But if you're looking for anything new used, um, Ford, Lincoln, or whatever, I'm sure they could find anything you want. Um, check them out, diffieford.net, and then on Instagram at diffiefordlincoln. This episode is presented by the Choctaw Nation. The Choctaw people have a rich history and a bright future. 
At the Choctaw Cultural Center, you can take part in a story 14,000 years in the making. Stroll through our immersive exhibits portraying Choctaw life from the moment our ancestors emerged from the Nani Weha in Mississippian homelands to the Trail of Tears, where we lost so many loved ones, and finally to the modern-day tribe making a positive impact on local communities throughout southeastern Oklahoma. Try your hand at our social dancing and stickball and learn more about our vibrant culture through demonstrations, workshops, and classes. The kids will have a blast in our Luxie Activity Center. The Choctaw Cultural Center is more than a museum. It's a living, breathing experience. Visit ChoctawCulturalCenter.com to plan your visit. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.